Hey everyone, welcome to this next episode of your daily equation. Yesterday we focused on Einstein's E equals MC squared. Today we're going to focus on a different equation but related to E equals MC squared. It's the time dilation equation. It's a wonderful, profound equation that in fact allows us to seriously talk about a certain kind of time travel, not sort of sci-fi time travel, but unless the sci-fi film is really good, had good advisors perhaps, but real time travel written into the laws of physics. All right, so let's jump right into it. The environment, the situation is very similar to that which we discussed yesterday with e equals mc squared. Albert Einstein is at the patent office, 1905, Bern, Switzerland, thinking about the ways in which you might synchronize clocks that are at a distance from one another, thinking about light and its speed. And he comes to this wonderful and strange conclusion that the speed of light is a fixed, unchanging, constant number, 671 million miles per hour, 300 million meters per second. Use whatever units you like, one light year per year. It doesn't matter. The point is that that number in whatever chosen units is independent of who does the measurement, independent of the motion of the source, motion of the receiver, a fixed value for the speed of light. The speed of light is constant. Good. Okay. Now, why would this have any impact on our understanding of time or even space and time? Well, the answer intuitively is pretty straightforward. As I discussed yesterday, speed is nothing but a measure of how far you go compared to how long it takes you to get there and how far you go that's distance that's a measurement of space how long it takes you to get there is time right it's a duration it's how much time elapses and so if speed behaves weirdly at say huge speeds even the speed of light then space and time must behave weirdly too they are all intricately interconnected and what Einstein does in June of 1905 is he works out the implications of the constant nature of the speed of light on both space and time. And today we're going to focus upon the result he found for time. Now, there's one other piece of background that it's really good to have in mind that Einstein makes profound use of, which is simply this. If you are moving at a fixed speed in a fixed direction, not speeding up, not slowing down, not going around a curve or a bend or anything like that, then you have every right in the world to claim that you are at rest and it is everybody else you see who is moving with respect to you. You know, the example that we often use in this case, imagine you are on a train, okay? And you don't feel any bumps, you don't feel any turns, the train is moving at a fixed speed in a fixed direction. It could actually be in the station for all that you know. And you look out the window when you wake up and you see another train in motion. And for a split second, you don't know whether that train is moving, whether you are moving, because all you sense is the relative motion between them. And from your perspective, you're completely justified in saying that it is only that train that is moving because you look around in the train car. The seats aren't moving relative to you. The passengers, the other passengers are not moving relative to you. From your perspective, it is as if that train is stationary, even if it happens to be hurling down the tracks at 100 miles an hour. You have absolutely every right to claim that it is the other train. In fact, everything else in the world that you see out of your window that is moving relative to you. Fixed speed, fixed direction. You don't feel the motion, no acceleration. You can claim to be at rest. Good. Okay, so now how do we make use of the constant nature of the speed of light and this sort of obvious fact that you can claim to be at rest if you're not accelerating, how do you make use of that to gain some insight into the nature of time? All right, now to do that, we need a clock, a device that measures how much time elapses in any given situation. And I could introduce whatever clock I'd like a grandfather clock. I could introduce a Rolex watch. We could use the time as measured by my iPhone. Any clock is really as good as any other, as long as it's well made. But for the analysis that we're about to undertake, there is a very special kind of clock that makes the mathematics and the physics and the analysis much easier. It is an unfamiliar clock. It is called a light clock. 
I don't know the history of who introduced it. It's a wonderful pedagogical device. Maybe it was Einstein, but I think it may have been Richard Feynman. Maybe somebody will tell me the detailed, intricate details of the history of the light clock. But what is a light clock? It is simply two mirrors that are parallel to one another with a single ball of light bouncing up and down between the two mirrors. When the ball of light goes up, we call it tick. When it goes down, we call it tock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. That is a clock because you can measure durations by how many round trip travel times, how many tick tocks go by on the light clock. So just so you have a little visual picture of that, I have an animation which I believe I can bring up. Good, here it is. So there are two light clocks side by side. Each has this mirror, these mirrors that are parallel to each other. And there you see it, tick tock, tick tock. And the counter on top simply counts the number of tick tocks that go by. So if you want to know how long it takes someone to whatever, eat a pizza, just count how many tick tocks on the light clock go by, and that gives you a measure of how long it took that event, that eating of the pizza, to take place. So although it is an unfamiliar kind of clock, it does what any other clock in the world does. It measures how much time goes by between the start of an event and the conclusion of an event. Now, why do we introduce this particular strange clock? We introduce it because it's so simple, right? It has no gears, no quartz crystal, no cesium atom vibrating. And because it's so simple, its inner mechanism is so simple, we can easily determine how motion affects the passage of time on a moving version of a light clock. We can figure out how motion affects the passage of time. And that's ultimately what we are after. So what we're going to do in a moment, and I'll show you it in an animation, but let me first describe it in a more homegrown way. I'm going to take one of these light clocks. I'm going to set it into motion, fixed speed in a fixed direction. That's crucial. And I'm going to figure out how the motion affects the tick tocking of the clock. But before I do that, there's often a confusion that seeps in. People often wonder, well, look, if the clock is in motion, light clock is in motion, the ball of light, people wonder, might not simply go up and down. It might hit the sides, bounce around. Maybe I destroy the workings of the light clock by having it go in motion. And if I was accelerating the clock, there'd be some issues there. But imagine this clock has always and forever been going at a fixed speed in a fixed direction. Will the ball of light still go tick tock? Answer, absolutely yes. What's the argument? Very simple. If the clock is going at a fixed speed in a fixed direction, then if I'm carrying the clock, for instance, I can claim to be at rest. And all of you, I would say, are moving relative to me. And since I'm at rest, the light clock will do what it always does. Tick tock, up and down, the ball of light will travel. How could your motion out there have any impact on the inner workings of the light clock? Since I am not accelerating fixed speed in a fixed direction, Claim to be at rest, light clock does what it always does. Good, okay. Now, there is something that does change when you watch my light clock in motion. Imagine it in your mind's eye. I'll show you in animation in just a second. The ball of light starts here, and as I'm moving from your perspective, not from mine, but from your perspective, the ball of light will go up and down, right? It goes up to meet the upper mirror and down to now reach the lower mirror, this clock is in motion. So you see the ball of light go in a double diagonal up and down. And the key thing is the trajectory, the path is longer for the double diagonal than it is for the straight up and down. And because the speed of light is constant, if the light has to travel a longer distance to go tick and a longer distance to go tock than it would in the stationary clock, then it will go tick talk more slowly. There'll be fewer tick tocks, therefore on the moving clock compared to the stationary clock, less time will elapse on the moving clock compared to the stationary clock as you watch, say, my moving clock go by you. You work out the number of tick tocks on your stationary one, it will be a bigger number of tick tocks, more time will elapse than on the moving clock. Let me show you that one to make it a little bit more clear. So here what I'm going to do, exactly what I did with my hands. I've got these two light clocks. I'll leave one stationary, the one on the left, 
and the one on the right starts to move. And notice that the double diagonal trajectory is longer, so the tick-tocks are happening at a slower rate. And look at the counter. Less time has elapsed on the moving clock from our stationary perspective compared to that on the stationary clock itself. Time slows down on a moving clock is what this argument gives us. And key to this is that the speed of light is constant because the light is traveling a longer distance at the same speed in order to go tick-tock in the moving clock. And therefore, it goes tick-tock less frequently, less time elapses. That is an astonishing conclusion. Before Einstein's realization of this effect called time dilation, everybody thought that time is universal. Isaac Newton imagined that there was this cosmic clock out there in the universe relentlessly ticking forward second after second after second, independently of who's doing the observing, independently of who might be in motion. And yet, Einstein realizes that that universal cosmic clock is a fiction. It's a fantasy. The rate at which time elapses is very much in the eye of the beholder. It depends on who is in motion and who is doing the observing. And that is a stunning realization. It cracks the universality of the Newtonian notion of time, leaving us with an Einsteinian version in which time elapses differently for different individuals if they are moving relative to one and other. And we can now go a little bit further and let's get to the equation, which will tell us the factor by which time slows down on a moving clock. And we can work that out. It's a pretty straightforward calculation. Let's do it together. I'm going to do it right here on the iPad that'll come up on your screen. And what am I going to do? Well, here is my, say, stationary light clock. And in this case, the ball of light is going up and down to go tick-tock. And let's call it a distance L that it has to travel to go up and down. And now let's compare that to, say, the moving light clock. And the moving light clock, the ball of light, is going on this double diagonal to go up and down. In fact, I'm really only going to focus on the tick, the talk is the same. So the ball of light goes like that. And let's call this distance L prime. And if you want to figure out the ratio of time elapsed on the stationary clock compared to time on the moving clock, well, again, more time will elapse on the stationary compared to the moving clock. And that therefore has the ratio of L prime over L. So imagine, just for argument's sake, that the L prime, the diagonal trajectory for the moving clock, imagine it's whatever, three times larger than the straight up and down trajectory on the stationary clock. Then the moving clock will tick slower by a factor of three. Less time will elapse on it, therefore, by a factor of three. And therefore, the ratio of time on the stationary clock compared to time on the moving clock will be three. Three times more time will elapse in the stationary compared to the moving clock if L prime over L was equal to three. So in one concrete example, but what we want to do is we want to imagine that this clock here has a given velocity called V and we want to work out L prime over L in terms of V itself. How do we do that? Well, it's actually a, a straightforward calculation just makes use of nothing more profound than the Pythagorean theorem. It's, it's really quite beautiful. So let's imagine that you and I are watching the moving clock in motion. And what do we say? We say, from our perspective, imagine that it took a time delta s for the ball of light to go from the bottom of the moving clock to the top mirror of the moving clock. And if that was a time delta s, then we would say that the clock moved from here to here. How far will it go? Well, it's velocity times time. So this would be v times delta ts. And we say that this up and down distance is equal to l. And now you see that we have a kind of beautiful little right triangle. And that will allow us, using the Pythagorean theorem, to relate the, the various times at 
hand, right? So how do we do that? Well, we know, I'll just write over here, that L squared plus V squared delta TS squared, that's A squared plus B squared in high school language, is equal to L prime squared. Now L prime squared I can also be a little bit more cunning about. This distance will be equal to delta TS, the amount of time that it took the ball of light to go from the bottom mirror to the top mirror, times the speed of light, the constant speed of light C. So I can now set L prime squared equal to delta TS squared times C squared. Okay, that's great because now I can write L squared is equal to delta TS squared times C squared minus V squared. And therefore L is equal to delta TS times the square root of C squared minus V squared. Okay, now I can take that and plug it upstairs into our little ratio over here. L prime itself is equal to C times delta TS. And then if I put down the L downstairs that we just calculated, that is the square root of C squared minus V squared delta TS. Cancel out the delta TS's and divide top and bottom by C just to simplify and I get one over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. And that little expression is the beautiful answer that we get to. It has a name. Maybe I should give it another color just to sort of highlight it. This guy has a name. It's called the gamma factor. And it tells us, as we just arrived, that the ratio of elapsed time on the stationary clock, this guy over here, compared to elapsed time on the moving clock, is given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So just to summarize that, we just found that delta t s is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared times delta t moving. So we are the stationary observer watching that clock in motion. And this factor over here, which I gave the name gamma, notice that gamma is always greater than 1 because v is always between 0 and c. And therefore, the denominator that we have in that expression will always be less than 1. And the reciprocal of a number less than 1 is always a number that will be bigger than 1. So there it is. There is this beautiful time dilation formula. And you notice that for everyday velocities, v is so much smaller than c that this gamma factor is so close to 1 that we don't notice it. And that is why for thousands of years we have been fooled into thinking that time is universal, that time is independent of our motion. It's not independent of our motion. And if we grew up in a world in which we routinely traveled at velocities v that were near the speed of light, we would all know that in our bones. But we don't know it in our bones because we don't live in that world. But Einstein revealed that at speeds close to the speed of light, this gamma factor gets bigger and bigger. And that means that the time dilation gets larger and larger. And in fact, I can even show this to you in the little demonstration that I'll bring up over here. Great. So here are two clocks side by side. And in this demonstration, I'm going to pick the speed of the moving clock and show you how time elapses on that clock compared to the stationary clock. Stationary clock, excuse me. So imagine that that moving clock says in a rocket ship, we're picking the speed of the rocket ship. Okay, let me put in an ordinary number. I'll put in, you know, whatever, a thousand miles an hour. Let me put this in. Okay, thousand miles an hour. And I hit, and there you see that there's virtually no difference between the ticking of the two clocks because the slowdown of the moving clock is barely noticeable. But now I'm going to put in a bigger number. Let me put in say 667 million miles an hour, okay? Now look at what happens. Look at the hand on the clock on the rocket ship. It is ticking off time so much slower 
than time on our watch, time on a stationary clock. And this is really how time itself behaves. Time slows down for a clock that is in motion. And indeed, if you imagine, therefore, going on that rocket ship, going out into space, turning around and coming back, on your moving clock, from our perspective, we will see that you've only aged one year. These, these durations that clocks are measuring are real time. It's like biological time. It's psychological time. We will see that you have aged only one year, say, on that round trip journey. But when you step off the ship, our clocks on Earth, they've been spinning around really quickly. And therefore, it might be a thousand years into the future, 10,000 years into the future, a million years into the future, all dependent on how closely your speed V gets to the maximum speed, the speed of light. So it's a wonderful, profound insight. Many puzzles, if you think about this, things that go under the name of the twin paradox, which I'm happy to answer questions about this. If you, if you want to ask about them in the comments section, you should think about it too. You know, the basic question is, you know, from the perspective of the person on the rocket ship, couldn't you flip the argument around and say that the clock on Earth is ticking off time? more slowly than their clock. Think about that one. There's an answer for why that argument fails and why it truly is the case that the person stepping off the rocket ship would be actually younger than the person who stayed on Earth. But I'll let you think about that one. But that's our equation for today, the time dilation equation that comes out of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Again, love to hear your suggestions for other equations. I think tomorrow I will likely look at the so-called Lorentz contraction formula, which shows the effect of motion on space. Today we did time. And from there, I, uh, I don't know exactly where we go. I'll take your suggestions, maybe a little bit more of relativity and so forth, but uh, join us. And I look forward to seeing you at the next episode tomorrow. Okay, take care.